your body is responding so proficiently to any form of stress, you never have uh, basically inflammatory conditions develop. I mean, whether it's a, a cut or twist or a bang, your body recovers so quickly. Especially if you immediately apply contact healing to any traumatized area, your body is in recovery mode within one, within one to three minutes. I mean, uh, uh, no black and blue marks, no uh, indications of any of that. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, and the, the biggest contributors is microbial cultures, and uh, and uh, the individual as an individual. You are in a health when you are in a healthy state. Uh, by in the field of microbiology, they'll say that 90 percent of your genetic material is of non-human origin. Basically, only 10 percent. You're basically bug, bug factory. Uh, you have 20 to 50 times more microbial cultures than you have cells in your body, and they're basically the number one activist that determines overall health in the individual, and they are the most proficient enzyme manufacturing factory as well as amino acid factory. So, so there's no such thing really as uh, diminished enzyme reserves, it's just diminished ability to synthesize enzymes. Diminished, well, there is a diminished uh, levels of reserves and, uh, and associated with that, it'll diminish your ability to synthesize that because you're not going to be able to as you diminish your enzyme reserves, you also become limited and compromise how much protein you can digest uh, or how much, uh, uh, how much uh, fat you can digest or starch. So individuals, by consuming pre-digested foods like sprouted foods, uh, which are partially or totally pre-digested, and uh, also high enzyme solutions like uh, green juices and all that, uh, your body will rejuvenate its enzymatic production capacity which, and also taking microbial cultures by way of either uh, in the capsules or by way of some small amounts of ferments that will encourage proliferation of uh, your uh, probiotics. And in a healthy individual, you have about four pounds of probiotics in the gastrointestinal tract. 60% of your fecal matter is made up of microbial cultures. And that's, that's when you have that, then uh, the markings on your anus becomes practically non-existent. Matter of fact, Dr. Dr. Uh, uh, the author of the book, uh, uh, sea Energy uh, Agriculture, in his uh, first edition, he says, if the same rule was applied to humans as it is to animal husbandry, uh, any markings on the anus is an indication of a state of disease uh, within the animal kingdom. He says everybody would be classified sick. Yes? I was just curious what your position is on, on salt. On salt? Sea salt, of course, you're referring to. Or just salt. In general, I mean. No, I, 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 I don't know any other salt but sea salt. Okay. Uh, so sea salt is good for you. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people will argue, they say it's in organic minerals. And I come back and I say, yeah, it might be in organic minerals. Uh, but what happens is if you have healthy microbial cultures in your gastrointestinal tract, these microbial cultures are plants. They'll suck up the inorganic minerals, convert it to organic minerals, and all of a sudden you've got wonderful uh, bioavailability of organic minerals. You should be using sea salt in your sprouting water. You put in uh, into your indoor gardening. I use sea salt with my, in Costa Rica, I have a, a grove of mangoes. I spread handfuls of sea salt all around the rim of the uh, mango trees. Uh, I do that on my papaya trees, on my coconut trees. Everybody gets salted. And the consequence, the taste is exquisite. I mean, First of all, it just takes it to the optimal eugenic potential of the plant kingdom itself, because now they have full spectrum of minerals. So I'm very much pro salt in moderation as anything. I had a question regarding um, kombucha. I'm yeah. interested in doing a study. Uh, to, uh, kombucha right now is a real fad kind of thing in uh, Whole Foods markets, and um, I'm interested in finding out the what you think the the effects of doing a week-long study where daily consumption of say 16 ounces of kombucha which is essentially what a a single serving is from uh, from a whole foods like market uh -huh. GT's um, kombucha what you think the effects on body pH would be um, in a week of, of drinking such a you know a 2.5 to 4 pH solution 
um, daily, but extremely probiotically yeah. active. Uh, you better brush your teeth for <laughs> after the, the drinking, uh, because it is going to be causing uh, basically uh, man, man, uh, your uh, basically some impact on the dental, uh, as well as also. Uh, uh, hydrate yourself from other sources. As I said, it's commonly accepted in the healing arts that if, if your diet is uh, at least 80% alkaline, the 20% that you're consuming from other sources, your body will be able to successfully compensate for it. So, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, kombucha is definitely kind of a, you know, fattish uh, thing. It's, uh, it's a good drink, better than drinking Coca-Cola or drinking, uh, you know, um, other beverages. Uh, so is uh, green tea is very nice, uh, black tea, but eventually what you want is basically alkaline solutions like celery, cucumber juice, and uh, good old water with maybe a little sea salt added to it. I once uh, remember you saying uh, kombucha kind of melts you away. Yeah, very well put. I had very interesting experience years ago. Uh, a Mennonite family uh, came to our retreat center, and uh, I had a consultation with uh, the the woman of the family that had six children, and but she was raw vegan and stuff like that, and and she had she had thinning hair, had migraines, and her teeth were uh, on edge. They were highly sensitive and painful uh, to chew, and uh, so I ex I evaluated her on everything and. Uh, uh, you know, the only thing I could think of, you know, where is she acidifying? So I asked her, you know, how are you on liquids? She says, well, I drink eight glasses. I said, well, that sounds good. And uh, her diet was good. I, I said, look, I can't really understand too much what's going on with you. Uh, let me call you back later. So I called her back a week, and somehow or other, I says, I finally, I says, it has to be the liquid. So I says, well, what do you drink for liquids? Eight glasses of kombucha tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, that was acidifying her, causing her thinning of the hair, her dental problems, her, also her uh, uh, headaches or migraines, whichever were. Uh, she discontinued it, uh, reduced it later to a moderation of one, one glass per day, and now she was doing quite well with herself. But, you know, it's best uh, uh, eventually to be, like I said, on 100% alkalinity, like all the wild animals are. Wild animals, alkaline, as a result, they keep maximizing their optimal potential. So can you go over what uh, um, some, al some daily alkaline drinks would be again? Oh, just uh, what is yeah. being served here, all the cucumber celery juices and then drinking water with sea salt and uh, alkaline is also, you know, like many, most, most of the herbal teas uh, and also uh, in particular, you know, green teas, stuff like that, white teas, but you know, much more moderation. Uh, the best is the green juices uh, in terms of realkalizing. Could you please emphasize again the, the formula you mentioned about the sunflower seed? Yeah, yeah I basically it's 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 not nothing. There's nothing in in nature that calls for precision. So primarily, yeah, I, I mentioned like about a, a half a cup of sprouted wheat. I uh, uh, sprouted for 24 hours, and I have. Uh, put in a jar and then a half a cup of uh, sunflower seeds uh, that are whole, hulled, and non-rancid, so they're fresh. And uh, basically put it in a blender with some water, chop it up a few times, you know, on off, on off. So it chops it a little bit, pour it in a gallon jar and fill it up with warm water and let it sit for about two days and it'll have a lemonish fragrance, a little bit of bubbly, and then you can refrigerate it and use it in uh, all kind of uh, uh, preparation concoctions. Do you, uh, do you ever jump ahead and put a kind of culture in, like some acid office? Oh yeah, then it just jump starts the whole yeah. thing. It practically cuts it by half the fermentation time. And uh, the, the heating uh, makes a difference. And, uh, uh, you know, so I, I often uh, do my fermentation in a dehydrator set about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the other thing about that is that when you control the culture, you're more likely to get an optimal culture yes. versus, you know, the Ann Wigmore approach, which is whatever happens to land it. Oh, yeah. No, this is exactly it. And the problem is also further complicated is that. Uh, she, she just felt like everything was great as long as it was natural. 
she's chewing bananas. Next thing you had basically alcoholic beverages being drunk <laughs> at, uh, at the early Hippocrates. And people were wondering why they had not so much energy and they were, you know, having hangovers. Uh, and uh, then there was also this stinky uh, stuff that came from, you know, spoiling. It took me a while to get to make good Jujuflag. Uh, some people are quite easy at it, uh, and finally now I got it where it's, it works out fine consistently. But often it would just have a strong smell of, uh, you know, putrefaction, and that's and people will drink that, say, "Well, that's and we drink." <laughs> and the early the early version was she didn't take into consideration what uh, uh, our esteemed minister, uh, Professor Zakeli, had. Basically, she took she would just soak wheat and all the excretions of the soap water were in the rejuvenate. Uh -huh. So it had, it had uh, all kind of metabolic waste, it had enzyme inhibitors, it had phytates, huxalates. I mean, it's a wonder that it was initially even started out, but eventually we developed more and more wisdom that, the first, that you're, you should be working with the sprouted wheat, not with the first soaking of the wheat. But I still remember when I was with her, I spent seven years with Anne in service. Yeah, I, I, I was, on, uh, we, we ordered by mistake. I was uh, sunflower seeds because I, th I thought, they didn't know that you asked ask for whole sunflowers, so I got the ones with the seed shells on it. And all of a sudden we're trying to use them in our uh, nut milk productions and couldn't do it. So I just threw the whole bag, 50 bag, uh, 25 pound bag into the compost and uh, came back a week later and I see the whole place covered with these most beautiful looking uh, weeds that I've never seen before uh, at uh, a range. So I picked them up and I'm uh, nimbling on them and they tasted so good and uh, and then I, I noticed that they, I says, God, they're, gro they're growing on these sunflower seeds. That's interesting. <laughs> well, Finally, I made the connection. Uh, so the next thing we did was introduce sunflower growing at Hippocrates. And then another incident was with buckwheat. Uh, uh, buckwheat ended up being uh, one of the other extremely successful succulent greens. But see, buckwheat is part of the rhubarb family, which are noted, as you very well know, that it has a very strong thinning effect on the bloodstream. So it's medicinal in its own right. So when we were when you're using too much of buckwheat, you wipe out your red blood cell count and you move into anemia and pernicious anemia and you get, you get the tingles, they all used to talk, or oh, you're just cleansing. Well, you know, it's a good thing that uh, my, my research pointed into the mechanism and uh, limitation of buckwheat, we still consume it at Hippocrates. But, you know, most people will take a handful instead of drinking a tray of buckwheat juice. And in six weeks, they got pernicious anemia. So it's still a good food. And this is a commentary that I want to make about food. There is a, there is a journal that is uh, basically uh, put out by the Sci uh, uh, Academy of Science entitled Natural Toxins in Food. Basically, all foods are really, in a way, have toxic components. And the only thing that keeps you from getting wiped out by it is your enzymatic sorting that is being done by your immune system. So you get rid of in many different tricky ways. Like good example is the fact that wheatgrass is high in cyanic acid, cyanide, poison. You know, but what it is is normal reproductive cells are loaded with beta rhodinase enzyme which neutralizes the cyanic acid and is passed out through urine. However, cancer cells do not have beta rhodinase. So their wheatgrass ends up, uh, the cyanic acid kills selectively cancer cells. And if you're on the right dietary approach, you'll be wiping out your cancer cells and excreting them out of your system. So you might say wheatgrass is an oncologist's dream. You know, I mean, no toxic effect uh, uh, chemotherapy because it targets cancer cells. So uh, it still comes down to enzymes and the ability to adapt to the toxic environment, to adapt to emotional craziness, to adapt yourself to also the dietary kind of abuses and, you know, 
an expense of longevity. And you end up living maybe 60, 80 years instead of the biblical uh, mention, you know, Methuselah, 900 years plus, and probably could have gone on longer. But it allows you to, to experience and live out your dharma. Once you're finished, you can move on into other levels of awareness and incarnations and experimentation, uh, serving the creation and one another of the creation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.